So, and you have so many different audience types that you have to make sure you have a persona for each one of those because they're all coming in for different right. different things. So. That's a great point. Can I ask a question? Sure. How many personas do you have for them? We have five. What are they? Yes, yeah, so we have treatment seekers, potential patients, caretakers, referring physician, and job seekers. Okay. Yeah, job seekers. Yeah, I did notice the caretaker lately. I think Huge. you did some uh, enhancements, um, and I got some emails around, you know, are you a caretaker for somebody and yeah. some of the functionality. So that must have been more recent. Yeah, because I think it's a growing audience base yeah. because of the growing older population and more people having to do it themselves. So you can't ignore them. It's, they're very important just as much as anyone else's. Great question. I'm going to kind of change, change topics because I know there's a lot of developers in the room as well. How important, um, and this is directed to Derek, but anyone else, please um, feel free to um, add your opinion as well. But how important do you think it is from a developer perspective to know what is going on from a UI UX perspective and marketing perspective? Um, whether you sit on, in IT, sit on the business side of the house, how important do you think that um, bridging that connection or gap is? Well, like I, we were talking about audience research, you know, that's more of a line of business thing, but the developer needs to understand that too to help form the UI and structure the user experience. So, I mean, they kind of really just go hand in hand. What's usually, and I necessarily don't have an interface with your team, but at which point do you guys like to be engaged? Is it more around where the product managers are defining requirements, or is it more where the UI designers are doing the design? With our team, it's really small. Definitely not as big as consumer. So there's a lot of stuff that we aren't doing. Um, and obviously, the line of business handles more audience research and stuff like that. But I feel like they look more towards more to the developers to figure out what the best flow is instead of relying on your audience research, <clears throat> which I <coughs> I think that's always a better outcome. More time than spend on audience research in the beginning and during your entire development, less time you're going to have. So I feel like, you know, the, the users for the uh, user experience and the user interface, developers tend to know more because they engage with the community. So they know more about what's going on in the world, what's the most advanced way that you know that's coming and you know. And uh, when the plan of business talks to the actual customer, he does not know what he does not know. So, so at the UI and UX perspective, talking to the technical people would help in the sense like they would have some perspective about, you know, now this has come in and you could do this. Whereas you have to teach the consumer to do that. He'll feel awesome about it. So, so I think the, the business people and technical people have to engage as far as the technological advances in the UI and UX spectrum, especially. Uh, I completely agree. Um, I, I couldn't agree more, actually. So the way, typically, the process is a, is a very waterfall process, at least in, um, at least old school mobile, right? Where you do a bunch of requirements, you figure out the UI from a business standpoint, and I throw it over there to Derek and be like, hey, go figure it out, right? Go build me this something. Um, the, the approach we're taking is, um, we call it Lean UX Design. Um, so where, as we are iterating on wireframes and visual designs, um, we iterate first in a small group that's very product ownership perspective. So in this case, in this example is, is my team. Um, and then from there, quick follow up, the next day, we, we provide feedback to this, to the UI people. Um, and the next day we bring in us, the UI team, and the technology team. Because some of the things that we want to do is potentially, he's going to be like, no, we are not there yet. We don't have the services, we don't have the API available, we don't have, you know, Cordova or Ionic or whatever framework these guys are using that, you know, I know enough to be dangerous to 
with, um, they'll be like, no, Fazir, you can't do that, right? So um, bringing them in early, or the other opportunity that we've seen is that they're coming to us with better ideas, right, to your point. So it's, um, I, I couldn't agree with you more. We've seen a lot of synergies, and that's, I think, is a bit of best practice for us, and I think for a lot of companies can definitely learn from kind of that model. Um, but it takes time commitment, and a lot of companies don't have, you know, the technical, the technical resource capability to be involved early on in the design process, and it's a must. Yeah, yeah I totally agree. I think it's important to uh, get, you have to bring the groups together, because a lot of times really good user experiences can be very costly or time consuming to build, but there's a lot of trade-offs and things that, you know, so UX is very focused on like user experience, how to get the job done, how they can uh, complete what they need to do in the easiest way possible that's intuitive to them. And development has the you know experience of like, here's how expensive this is to build, here's how much time it'll take, here's what we have already in a pool belt. And I think it's very important to bring that together early on. Otherwise, you can spend, and I work with a lot of smaller startups, smaller companies, um, you can spend a lot of time building things that you don't have the bandwidth and runway to build, and that can really uh, catch business by surprise sometimes. So, very important to bring that on early and collaborate. So. so if you guys take anything away from this discussion, it's definitely that point. <laughs> Technology needs to be engaged early if possible. And, and uh, use a building test. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know we kind of went down this path, but I'm just curious, because a big thing on usability is collecting data points and knowing, knowing your audience and actually either testing in person. There's a lot of tools now that you can test remotely. Yeah. There's things like full story, um, other company user testing, things like that that will facilitate remote testing. I'd just be curious what tools people use and how they gather their data points. Uh, user testing? Yeah, it's just as far as user testing, you know, gathering data, ROI, user testing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then also, we, you know, as, as I said, we partner with someone else that, another company, not sure who they use, but they definitely use someone. Yeah, we've, uh, we use user testing right now before I use Usability Hub. The tricky thing about Usability Hub is a lot of UX people that's also doing it too, but you can earn credits as you, like, so your account can build credits as you actually conduct testing as well. So if you do somebody else's test, um, and then you can also send the link out to users as well. So that's another way to get information too. Um, and then there was this whole, I'm trying to think of what the link is, but there is a great website that has all of these UX tools that anywhere from you trying to plan a project to actually doing user testing to doing surveys, it's a whole list of tools that you can go online and use as well too. User Zoom is a good one too, more expensive though, um, so that's more on the enterprise side, but there are tools. And nothing, um, you know, the other, the other plug I'd throw out there is uh, nothing beats a, uh, email survey, so that's, uh, here's some screens, tell me what you guys think. <laughs> Made MailChimp. Right. Plus, <laughs> plus in-person testing too, I mean, you, you yeah. can't, that to me is the best thing to have. Yeah. We'll just set up a little desk somewhere and grab somebody, bring them over and, and just sit there and watch them and then ask them specific questions, get their feedback. But from an ROI perspective, everything we do on the website, we trace it, we try it. I can tell you how many appointment requests we've done, how many Forms are filled out. We can put a dollar amount around. I mean, how much of traffic it? Like, you have to really track everything that's done on the site in order to be able to be successful. And Dan, to, to Lynn's point, I recently attended a UXPA event at Progressive Insurance, and they're using a pet technique, persuasion, emotion, and trust, where they're actually interviewing someone, the, the consumers in person to really gauge their motivations on why they're, they're buying a certain way, not their, from the um, emotion standpoint. So more truly, why are they navigating the website and then why the final, hey, I'm gonna buy this type of insurance. So I think it all depends on the customer and the user the and it, the product, it, it definitely varies across um, platforms. Yes. Uh, I did my master's in Full Sail University, which has like one a fancy usability lab. They built it with 1.5 million dollar. <laughs> so it's they do like biggest game come game uh, have actually come there for their usability testing. 
So they have eye trackers, they have uh, nerve trackers and all those things. They plot the chart at the end of the day and they actually see. Like, there were some crazy things like there was a designer who came up and uh, I was actually volunteering for that. So how they do is they actually take the interview. If, if you want to come down and actually do the usability test because it's the fanciest game you can ever play. Like you'll be playing like <laughs> that game after a year or so. so You'll have a huge line, people coming. So we take interviews, like we'll see. Okay, now we want people who play racing game. And there is a certain part of thing they want to test. Like, is the controls fine or something like that? So they, we actually do an interview. Are you a guy who actually likes game, uh, racing games and all those things? And then we put that uh, eye trackers and all and see where is actually looking at it. Like the designer wants them to actually look at the console in the down, but the person sees somewhere on the top. So those. Those eye trackers and all those things are actually helping them a lot. So what software do you use for the eye tracking? So there is one, uh, I exactly don't remember the Moray name. Moray or Toby? Toby uh, and SMI. Toby. Uh, SMI is awesome. Yeah. But the toughest thing with Toby is it does not have that software where you actually plot things. Like you have to see by frame by frame and then do it yourself. Or Not spots. Yes, yeah. spots. And or I'll spend like huge money, give it them, give it to them, and then wait for the result. Yeah. So most of the time, what we do is we actually capture the video of that yeah. and analyze the video, play make it for as speed as possible, and then chart make a chart of it. Five x speed. It's like <laughs> I want to get the results quickly. <laughs> for the people that are using remote testing services, what are some of the downsides? that you're finding. I was looking at one, I forget what it was called, it was uh, made by Diamond Trace, but you know, it's, they basically just have a ton of racks with devices in them, and it seemed like you could do everything with the camera, pretty much. Has anyone used it, something like a service like that? I, well, I would say the biggest challenge is the follow-up. Um, we have a lot with user testing, we have a lot where we are very descriptive in every single step. Um, and you still don't have that user that's going to follow that. Um, so there are a lot of times we have to return some of the findings. There's also, um, I would say, a challenge that the the user kind of goes off on their own tangent. So the thing is, is that I've, very, I've been very used to doing a lot of in lab testing, and now kind of where I'm at now, we're doing more remote testing. So where you can kind of bring them back in and just say, okay, let's refocus, let's work on this task now. You don't have that as well. Um, so I think that's probably been the biggest challenge for me, um, kind of doing that. Have you ever used ones that they're they're completely automated, like it's not another person touching them? Um, no, I think for the most part, it's always been somebody. Oh, yeah, the services that I've seen, it's, it's literally just a ton of racks of devices, and it can do the accelerometer too, but I mean, it's obviously on, automated, so it's just running a software. And I just wonder how accurate if anybody's ever seen or used those services. Well, we have a UI that has this UI automatically once it has, so the whole user can place it, everything works. That's exactly what I'm actually Like an end to end test. Yeah, right. But this also does accelerometer and a couple other things, but I would imagine since it's in a rack, you could do the camera, right? So I've just been throwing it back and forth, you know, and it would be worth it me personally to pay something monthly for that instead of just buying a couple devices. And that gets very bank, you know, I need a book of devices. And I still don't have a, a tablet because I just figured that I'll just do UI testing on the simulator for the tablet, but I mean it can get expensive when you need to do find places for yourself. Yeah. 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 Does uh, anyone here use actual device testing during after everything's built, your environment's ready, before you go to production, you do in, in hand device testing? Most most everyone hopefully do. Hopefully yeah. do. I got a full device usually testing as long as I work for it. When the simulator lies to <laughs> you know, you try to get as far as you can, just... Uh, well, you know, we use the users in our company, we right. ad hoc users, when you know, have yep, yep. ad hoc you basically deploy it before it goes to the store, yep. people can play with it before, like, marketing folks play on it, play with it before we actually, you know, Yeah. it's a fairly successful. 
I do just manual testing. A lot of times we have the other pressure testing. Yep. Just for them, just for them to give them go. Now I just go through it myself. So for the, for the people who actually use tangible device testing, how far back in devices do you go? So do you have a couple of different old versions of iPhones? We used to really be heavy on, on all of them, but now it's, we just look at the most current. What's great about iOS is they just quit supporting a platform and they're just like, yeah, they're pretty quick. You gotta watch out for the Nook users. Be nice about a platform like that. As far as you talk about testing, whatnot, but as far as the performance from a uh, metrics of uh, you know, how successful it is with the customers, you know, like are you looking at downloads? Are you looking at yeah. Like hits per day, hits per, what, what are some of the metrics you use to identify the success great. of your application? Great, great question. Um, so there's a lot. There, there's a lot, but I, I would say um, the couple that a couple that I care about for my business, and I put them in two separate categories. Um, one is I measured against um, client satisfaction. So that is the ability for a client to actually access the banking app itself. So when they open it. Um, they can sign on. Um, so if the app is down, whatever re reason, you know, our data center is down or server's down or whatever, that's an accessibility metric that we measure, we hold ourselves to, um, and I hold myself accountable to. Um, so client satisfaction, client engagement, that's the biggest one. So one is um, around, we, it, it, and it's kind of, it depend, depending on who you talk to, it's important, but app store ratings. Um, you could have a few clients that are um, that put some bad stuff out there, and you get one star because you know they're PO. Um, then you have um, we look at downloads, we look at app sessions. What that means is the client has successfully logged in, um, and and then also we track all the way through them actually completing a transaction. Um, so an example of a transaction is taking a picture of their check to deposit the check. Um, and then from there, there's metrics that kind of roll up to depositing of a check, a dollar amount, amount of items per month, um, amount that were successful because some of those checks have failed. So there's there's every single process, at least within our mobile app, we, um, we track. But the biggest ones are around um, how, how satisfied is that client and how engaged were they in terms of using it. So um, you know, how many times do they come log in for a month to, to check their account. Um, that's a metric that I hope that grows uh, month over month. Do I generate a dashboard, like a daily or weekly dashboard that Correct. So, all these metrics? Yeah, so the, um, so the metrics to use an AirWatch, right? Well, AirWatch for mainly internal um, kind of device management, for, but for us, we, um, we have more of a dashboard of a monthly, monthly dashboard that gets rolled up, and then um, more of a weekly Weekly one that's kind of the high level metrics that we kind of keep up, keep an eye on. I think there's a question, a question right there. I was, I was about to ask you this. How much do DAU matter for apps like mobile apps and all? I mean, the banking apps, do they actually matter? DAU, daily active users, monthly active users? <laughs> they do. Active users, um, I care about a lot um, because that shows engagement. That goes back to engagement, right? So, um, the more clients, I'm probably getting in trouble for saying this, um, the more clients that I can get to my channel, it's, um, it, it, it's better for us because what that means is um, a client that is digitally engaged is we can tie it directly back to dollars and cents in the bottom line. So if you're digitally engaged and you're using mobile banking, you're using online banking, um, you're using bill pay, you're depositing a check, you're making a transfer, et cetera, um, you're less likely to leave the bank. So that's why I care about it. So that, um, my mind is it's always been the big kind of, in this kind of, um, like, the apps versus mobile friendly websites, right? How does that compare? Like, I've heard people say, you know, in, in five, 10 years, it's not gonna be apps, and it's gonna be just mobile friendly. Because so you got a website, it's gonna be active. So yeah, if you guys know HTML5, it's like when it first came out, I just started, I, I, every time, five times. And when something new comes out, I just mess around with it. Try to make sure that I'm doing Yeah, have you guys heard about the WebAssembly language announcement? Uh, I know MIT just, MIT just released like 10 languages. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Julia and some other for like five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so uh, <laughs> it was announced uh, not too long ago, but they're coming with a WebAssembly language. So it's low level <laughs> language for the web, basically. So eventually you're going to be able to use other languages other than JavaScript. And that WebAssembly language is going to talk to device hardware. And that's basically how it's going to work. And so do you prefer to JavaScript over everything? Right now, yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I'm a JavaScript developer. I came from. Is there bias in that? I was really fascinated with JavaScript. It's super efficient. Um, you know, it really is right once, run, run everywhere. And I feel like Java tried to do that and failed. And the reason I think that happened is because of classical inheritance versus prototypal inheritance with JavaScript. With JavaScript, you're not locked into this structure. If you've ever heard of the real I hate it. Java. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Class one here just locks you into, you know, a, a really rigid hierarchy where prototypal inheritance, you're sharing behaviors from other objects and then composing those into a new object. <clears throat> so um, I feel like it's a lot better suited for uh, the flexibility that it gives you. And then with Node too, um, JavaScript is asynchronous by nature and running single thread stuff on a node is much more efficient at IO than um, you know, a multi-threaded language. So, so then how do you guys think that apps are something that do buy a multi-threaded as So I'll give you the, the biased business strategy I do. Uh -huh. um, so I am a huge fan of native, building natively, um, but knowing, uh, kind of knowing you know, constraints the reusability of HTML5, um, you know, as a part of kind of what we what we want to do is, and I think a lot of other companies are realizing this too, is there's elements where you can have coexistence of native and HTML5. So bring them together and having this hybrid approach, right, where you're using components of native, accessing your geolocation and the camera, etc. Um, but you 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 have this HTML5 reusability component that can then transcend to um, to other sites, which is your different screen sizes, so your big desktop to your your iPad, tablet, etc. I think it's going to be more it's going to be more apt. Have you guys heard of things like uh, Native Script or React Native? It's basically um, writing JavaScript that compiles to native code, a lot like how. Um, Accelerator did it, or Sencha. Those were the first people to try and do it, but they sort of, they sort of didn't go about it the right way. So, uh, sorry. Tons of, tons of frameworks. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, after I hear you say, largely, you know, because the holy grail is kind of that user engagement, keeping user engaged, keeping them coming back, push notifications, feeding them data, getting them to come and interact with you, pushing, you know, your information to them, getting them engaged in your product, whether it be, you know, marketing or, just you know, loyalty to the brand because hey, we've got these great services. We're easy to use. Like, why wouldn't you be with KeyBank? Exactly. And I think that.